This video is made possible by donations to the United States Lighthouse Society from people like you. So I will uh, once again welcome you all to this this event. Thank you so much for being part of this today. So uh, just one small correction. Jeff was just talking about how we want everybody to subscribe to the YouTube channel. When you do that, as long as you're already registered on YouTube, you don't have to give your name and email address or anything. It just automatically subscribes you. And when you sign into YouTube, you'll, you'll get notices of uh, the latest videos that are posted. Um, but it's just a, a good idea to check uh, pretty often and see what we're, we're up to uh, video wise. So we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to it in a few minutes, where well, we're going to start. Yeah, let's stop talking about the boring stuff and start looking at some cool videos. That is a really, <laughs> really good idea. So I'll stop yakking here and let me go into screen sharing so I can show some stuff. So the, okay. the, uh, the, the, the different things we have posted, we have modern videos, current lighthouse stuff. We have historical videos. We have videos that we've posted, which are from foreign countries, which I find absolutely fascinating. So we're gonna share a, uh, we're gonna share a selection of things with you so you can get a flavor of what we have available on the website to look at. Yeah, uh, so I'm start, starting out here. Uh, I'm on the front page of the US Lighthouse Society website, which of course is uslhs.org. Uh, you're probably mostly familiar with it. And uh, there's all kinds of stuff on the front page. Uh, there's links every, every which way. And I'll just mention that the latest episode of the podcast is always right on the front page. You can listen to that very easily. But we're not talking about that right now. I just want you to know it's there. To get to the videos that we're talking about, what you need to do is up on this menu at the top, click on education. Uh, Jeff, while we're thinking about it, my recommendation would be to actually have a videos uh, link on that front page as, as well. But go to education and then on the left here under education, click uh, Lighthouse Videos and it takes you to this page, okay? So again, we're gonna talk about the YouTube channel separately. This is not the YouTube channel yet, but a, a lot of the, the videos that are on here are also on the YouTube channel. They're, uh, they're not exactly the same. It's not the same selection, but a lot of it is the same selection. So anyway, there's the, some stuff on this website that is not on the YouTube channel that are actually clips from like uh, Path A newsreels and stuff like that that are really cool. And if you look uh, at one of the headings here, Lighthouse Clips from the Past, and that's what we're going to look at first. So you click on Lighthouse Clips from the Past, and it takes you to this page that actually has another list of videos under that heading. And these are all videos from other sources, like I was saying, from old newsreels and things like that. And we thought we'd show you a couple. They're, they're mostly really short. So we thought we'd show you a couple of really interesting short ones. And one of them is this Wolf Rock Lighthouse, The World's Loneliest Christmas from 1950. And this, I believe, is from Pathé Newsreels in England. So uh, Wolf Rock, of course, is one of the, the, uh, the wave-swept, sea-swept uh, granite lighthouses of uh, England. Jeff, you were going to say something? No, I just wanted to point out, remind people that this is, we're, we're not uh, only dealing with uh, national subjects here. We, we're covering international subjects on our videos and our educational pages. So it's going to be all over the world. Right. Yeah. Good point. Just like on the podcast, it's mostly U.S., but I like to include uh, other countries as well. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start this video. And... Let me stop it for a second just to let you know, uh, anytime you're playing a video, most of you I'm sure know this, but e whether it's on the website here or on YouTube, uh, in the lower right where the square is, you click on that and it'll fill up your screen. So I'm going to start this again. I'm going to go to full screen. Halfway between Penzance and the Scilly Isles, there rises out of the turbulent sea, a beacon to men afloat. It's Wolf Rock, one of Britain's grimmest and oldest lighthouses. A Pathé cameraman joined the Trinity House ship satellite that relieved the Wolf's crew in time for the new year, only a few days behind schedule. Precariously tied to a buoy, the little boat has only a short time for the most treacherous operation in their dangerous journey, landing the new keepers. To cross this giant moat, where the smallest slip means certain death, 
the Trinity House men bring a bowline into action. Back across the raging waters, with a dipping on the way, are uh, launched the men who have spent the world's loneliest Christmas, men like Principal Keeper McCleary and Assistant Keeper Robertson. They had two months on this forbidding-looking rock. Their only link with land was a radio. Their home was a 200-foot-high tower. Beyond that, there was nothing but the sea. Now it's the turn of two others to enjoy the luxuries of Wolf Rock. A month's stay ashore lies ahead of the keepers who have come off duty, and few have deserved it more than they who typify the endurance of Britain's men of the lighthouses. I just love everything about that. <laughs> the music. The, yeah. the, I mean, can you imagine getting to a lighthouse on that rope, on the breeches buoy? Oh, my God. Just it, To me, it just drives home exactly how treacherous it could have been for lighthouse keepers. Yeah. That's actually the, the good side of lighthouse automation and destaffing is that people don't have to live in a place like that anymore. Uh, yeah. but, but for two months on that rock at a time, I mean, I can't even fathom what that would be like. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. I thought I've had a hard time getting on some lighthouses, but not quite like that. <laughs> that's off of uh, Cornwall, by the way, southeastern, southwestern uh, England. So I was going to play this uh, next uh, very short one, another Pathé newsreel from 1959, Copter Aids Lighthouse uh, off the uh, Brittany coast of France. So this is a, another pretty amazing one here. Just off Usant Island, Brittany, a lighthouse wrecked by the Nazis nearly 20 years ago, is coming back into service. Till 1940, it stood sentinel at the gale-torn northwest tip of France. Thanks to a helicopter, which can make a pinpoint landing, the lighthouse is at last being repaired. Up to now, no one was able to get the men and materials onto the site. Obviously, even without a helicopter, it would not have been completely impossible, or the lighthouse could never have been built at all. Nevertheless, the job hung fire all these years. Now, even a disabled workman can get to the place. With three others, he's taken to and from the job every day. And in addition, the Whirlybird has flown out five tons of cement and various repair materials. Thanks to this helicopter idea, the light put out by the Nazis will soon shine again. Okay. That was a... Incredible. That ladder, can you imagine, imagine climbing down that ladder down the side of the lighthouse? Insane. Yeah. Uh, okay, a couple more short ones here. One is uh, Twilight of the Beacons, and this has some fantastic footage of Boston Light uh, circa 1940. And, or 1939 to be exact. And the keeper you're gonna see inside the, the lens of the lighthouse at Boston Light is Maurice Babcock who was there for 15 years. And I knew his son, interviewed his son a couple of times. So yeah, I really love fun. this, I love this clip. This is a really good one. And it's such an important lighthouse in America. Yeah, and the same lens is still, still in use there. So I'll go ahead and play this. The U.S. Lighthouse Service is combining with the Coast Guard after two centuries of duty well done. The old cannon sounded fog warnings at Boston Light nearly 200 years ago. It's the oldest lighthouse in the U.S., built in 1716. Her lights have been dimmed only twice in her long career of guiding seafarers into the safety of Boston Harbor. The oldest light in New York Harbor is at Sandy Hook, and except for signs of wear and tear on its weather-beaten face, it's still as sturdy as ever it was. The only woman lighthouse keeper is Mrs. Fanny Salter, who tends the Turkey Point Light in Maryland. In place of electric light, she uses a paraffin lamp. It's one of the few of its kind in the world. Soon, many such lights will be dimmed, and Uncle Sam's lighthouses will give way to Coast Guard lightships. The twilight of the beacons is the penalty of progress. In uh, England, they call them paraffin lamps. We call them kerosene lamps. So that wasn't actually the, the Boston Lighthouse uh, uh, one that we were talking about. That was yeah. the, the, there's another one up with Boston Lighthouse, isn't there? That was the first half of that was Boston Light. Okay, Boston okay, Babcock, okay. Yeah. I think there's Boston. another one actually you can find there that uh, it's more about the, 
the Boston Light. This I, I thought this was interesting too because at the very beginning they were talking about the transition from the lighthouse service maintaining lighthouses to mm -hmm. the U.S. Coast Guard. Yes, which was 1939 right. when, that, when this video was done. Yeah. Um, so we're just going to play one more short one here, and you can see there's some some others on the page you can you can watch on your uh, when you have a chance. But let me play this uh, hazards of the sea video here, which is quite short from 1937. In the harbour, the evening sun shines down after the whining of the storm winds has subsided. But the seas are still running high as the lifeboat sets out for a hazardous adventure, the changing of the guard of the lighthouse, plowing through a mile of heavy rollers to bring relief to the men who should have been taken off a month ago, but have been storm-bound. Even now, it's difficult and dangerous to run a line from the bobbing boat to the lighthouse windswept platform, swaying like a feather in the wind with the foam-swept rocks below. So relief comes to the lighthouse after two months of storm-swept loneliness, after two months of listening to the symphony of the elements. And for the man who is being relieved, it's the swaying journey back to the boat, back to the harbour and home. These are the men who keep tireless watch over the lamps that are the mariner's guide, the lights that spell safety at sea. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to go back to the previous page and just sh show you again, there's all these different categories uh, you can watch. And again, most of these are the same videos that are on the YouTube channel. So we're actually going to spend uh, the rest of this event talking about the YouTube channel. But I recommend that if you, when you have a chance to just, uh, you know, look at the different categories here and, and see what's available. Uh, there's some, some of the kids videos are, I think, not on our YouTube channel. They're from various sources. So you might want to check those out. Those are pretty interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and get this window out of the way. And I've got a Google page up here just to show you that if you're not sure how, <clears throat> how to access the uh, U.S. Lighthouse Society's YouTube channel, one really easy way to do it is to get on Google. And I have in the search box here, USLHS YouTube. And if you do that search, it'll take you to, this will come up first, click on that, and here's the YouTube channel. Uh, another way to do it would be to put USLHS in the, in the bo box, the search box on YouTube at the top here. And right, so you would, so you, from Google, you would go to youtube.com and then you'd put USLHS in the search field. Uh, yeah, more or less. Yeah, okay. there's there's a couple of ways into it. You can just go from Google or just go right to USLH, go to right to youtube.com and search for USLHS. So when you get on the YouTube channel, this is the page that comes up. This video, Keep a Good Light, comes up automatically at the top and starts playing automatically. You can do what I just did and click on it to stop it from playing if you don't want to see it again every time you come on the page. Uh, and down below are some of the latest uploads that have been done on the channel and then playlists down the bottom or at the top. You can also access, I think playlists is a really good way to look at these. But we thought uh, the first thing we would do before we get into the various playlists is to sh actually show this video. A lot of you have probably seen it, but some of you probably haven't uh, called Keep a Good Light that I made a couple of years ago. And uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. So I'm just going to go ahead and play it and put it into full full screen.
Jeremy created that, and I just think it's just beautiful. What a beautiful piece, Jeremy. You did such a good job on that. Thank you. You know, I was thinking it was made in the, at the height of the pandemic, and it seemed uh, the message seemed especially poignant at that time. Uh, but it still applies, I think, uh, in, at any time. Yeah, the, the video is timeless. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't mention when I first got on the page here that the subscribe button is very prominent here. And we, as we talked about earlier, that's super important. You can see at this point, the U.S. Lighthouse Society has 370 subscribers, which is pretty good, uh, but we need to have more. Uh, so uh, well, all you need to do is click. I'm not going to click on it because I'm not signed into YouTube right now. You have to be signed into YouTube to be able to subscribe. And there's not that doesn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. It's really all you have to do is uh, fill in a couple of things. It's uh, really, really easy to just uh, sign into YouTube. And they, so. they don't take your email and do anything with it. They don't spam you. They don't contact you. It's just right. About supporting the Lighthouse Society's page, and as I said, our goal is to get to a thousand. We really need to get to a thousand before we can do anything more with the page to help generate some, uh, some uh, not only income but some more outreach for lighthouse preservation causes. Right. Um, so let's see here. Uh, we're going to look at uh, some of the playlists within the the uh, the channel here. Uh, so I'm going to click on playlists. And uh, multiple playlists are the ones that have the most videos in them here. Uh, you see the number one is uh, Lighthouse Podcast. There are 135. I've done over 200 episodes of the podcast, but there are 135 of them. I wasn't doing them on putting them on YouTube originally, but it's just another way for people to hear the podcast. And lately I've started doing some video versions of the podcast. We'll talk more about that shortly. Um, but first we wanted to show you the uh, USLHS historian videos, which are mostly things I've created over the last three years or so. So I'll click on that. And actually it automatically takes you to one of those videos when you click on a, a playlist like that, but you can easily, uh, this is about Destruction Island in Washington. So I, I just clicked on it to stop it. Um, and uh, let's see, one we wanted to show you Speaking of Boston Light again, there's one I did about the storm child story at Boston Light. This is a little bit longer than most of the things we're showing. This is about five minutes, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and play this, the storm child at Boston Light. Boston Light Station, commonly known simply as Boston Light, was first established on Little Brewster Island in outer Boston Harbor in 1716 and is the oldest light station on the North American continent. The original lighthouse was destroyed in the American Revolution in 1776, and the tower was rebuilt seven years later. In Boston Light's long history, there were no children born on the island until 1932. Ralph Norwood was an assistant keeper in the 1930s. Norwood and his wife Josephine were both natives of Maine. Ralph Norwood left a job in a textile mill to join the lighthouse service. First was a six-month stay at Great Point Lighthouse far out on the sandy dunes of Nantucket. By 1929, when they moved to Boston Light, Ralph and Josephine had five children. In April 1932, they believed the birth of a child was imminent and a doctor was called from the nearby town of Hull. It took an hour and a half for the boat to reach the island in heavy seas, and it was impossible to land at the dock. But it didn't matter because it turned out to be false labor. Josephine Norwood recalled what happened in a 1991 visit to Boston Light. I thought she'd be gone then, and she, she was, and it was just false. But it was a stormy <laughs> false night, labor wasn't it? Pains. Yeah. And the doctor tried to land, and of course he couldn't on account it was a storm and real bad weather. So he uh, had to turn around, go back to home. The Norwood's daughter, Georgia, was born a week later on April 11th in calm weather. But the next week she was born, everything was okay. <laughs> the headlines from the night of the storm forever stamped Georgia as the storm child. 
the writer Ruth Carmen based a novel called Storm Child on the story. The um, author of Ruth Carmen, of, she had written other books and she heard about George and wanted to write a life story. Georgia and her parents were showered with publicity and Hollywood subsequently came calling to make a movie version of Storm Child and five-year-old Georgia was slated to play herself. Described as smiling and sunny curled, Georgia was billed as the Bay State's own Shirley Temple. But the movie wasn't destined to be. I had other children. I couldn't uh, just pick out and I wouldn't let them have Georgia. So she would have taken it to Hollywood, but it wasn't for her. Georgia agreed, saying she didn't want to go to Hollywood. She wanted to stay at Boston Light. Georgia, the storm child, was featured in a number of newspaper and magazine articles. One writer described her as a sweet little powder blue eyed blonde. The legend of the storm child lived on. Georgia's son, Willie Emerson, later wrote a book called First Light, which relates the true story of his mother's birth and life at Boston Light. In the book, Georgia related her memories of life on Little Brewster Island. I liked living on Boston Light. It was my number one home. It was my birthplace. I always felt secure, peaceful, and happy there. I kept busy, for there was always plenty to do. We were all happy together and had many good times. It always seemed it would be our way of life forever. When I was five and Storm Child came out, that summer many tourists visited Boston Light. All summer, coming in all kinds of boats and beautiful yachts, big and small. Seemed someone always wanted a picture, and I soon grew weary of that. I would hide behind Daddy's chair so they couldn't find me. Then it was all over. We got on with a normal life. The family all went in their own directions, and that wonderful, wonderful life we had known on Boston Light was gone forever but still lives in our memories today. Now, the voice of uh, Georgia Norwood and that was my wife, Charlotte. <laughs> and, uh, she did you know, a nice Boston job. But yeah, Boston Light, what an amazing history to that lighthouse. And one of the most fascinating uh, tidbits of uh, history to me is when, uh, way back when, and you have to remind me of the date, but it was well before the American Revolution when the first lighthouse keeper, George Worthy Lake, was uh, uh, taking his uh, boat uh, back to the lighthouse uh, during a storm. And uh, he, him and his wife, I believe, and one of their children and the assistant were killed on that uh, trip across. Six people, six people in all. Yeah. Right, what year was that again? Uh, November 1718. We're right at the beginning of two years after the light was established, right at right. the beginning and, of our American lighthouse history. Yeah. And I mean, to, and of course, what a horrible tragedy. But to me, the most interesting part about that is a... Uh, young uh, Benjamin Franklin, as basically a child, uh, was so moved by the, uh, the, uh, the tragedy that he wrote a uh, very beautiful uh, poem-esque type of uh, piece for the local newspaper. Um, and I just, to think, to, just to, to, to match Benjamin Franklin with a lighthouse keeper to me is, is just incredible. As I, I get the same feeling when I read on a charter of a lighthouse that like George Washington was the one who who built it like Portland head you know it's, yeah. see that just uh, it, it just it, it, it just brings such uh, clarity Oops. reality to it to it yeah. yeah lost your voice there for a few seconds but right. yeah yeah uh, yeah um, Ben Franklin by the way referred to his poem the lighthouse tragedy later in his autobiography called it wretched stuff wasn't one of the things he was really proud of but it's a there is a fascinating piece of history there and how old was he when he wrote that? Do you remember? 12. He was 12. Well, wow, what um, an amazing person. <laughs> yeah. So I just be, I'm going to go to a different playlist here, but just to point out, uh, gives you the entire playlist on the right here when I went to US uh, LHS historian video. So you can pick out 
from all these. We're not going to play any more of these right now, but I've created uh, quite a few of them over the last three years. So you might want to check those out. Uh, but various aspects of lighthouse history all over the country. And I'm going to, whoops. Get rid of that. Sometimes you, you get on a video and you go to another page and the video keeps playing in a separate little pop-up window and mm -hmm. can be a, a little annoying if you don't want it there. Um, so we were going to go to special virtual events right here. Okay, there are 10 videos in this category in this playlist. And uh, we want to show you a little, little bit of one of them that was something we did. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure exactly when it was. It was May 17th, 2021. So over a year ago, a uh, year and a half ago. Um, and we invited, uh, I think we had 11 representatives of lighthouses from around the world, uh, mostly in this country, but we had, uh, we had ones from Canada and Sweden and Norway. Uh, take part in it. 11 people involved with lighthouses where people can stay overnight. And they all gave like an introduction about their place and we took questions and it was, uh, I thought it was a great event. So we wanted to play a little clip uh, for a few minutes about the uh, Potter Noster Lighthouse in, uh, in Sweden, which is absolutely fascinating. And uh, the, uh, the man who's the manager of that place is talking about it in this clip. He's actually the manager of the tourism company that runs it. So let me find, we wanted to go to 125, right about here. Let's try that. Okay. Uh, and this is our dining hall. We built the table in the room and uh, we bought this uh, beautiful uh, photo from an American artist called Christy Lee Rogers. She's a photographer taking picture of people underwater. So we wanted to keep this room uh, in the last thousand years on these reefs, the Paternoster reefs. Uh, it's, it's been, uh, the reefs has sunk about 1000 ships, no, 700, more than 700 ships. Uh, the last one with the lethal uh, exit was uh, 1969. But we wanted to keep this, this dining hall as a homage to everybody that lost their lives. So we thought it was kind of accurate nice to put this piece of art art piece that uh, of people being photographed underwater uh, this is our little living room it's only nine nine bedrooms and uh, here we got this is the uh, where the light lighthouse master had his his uh, office and the office bench has now turned into the bar and i got the key uh so if you come you can be nice to me you have all these charts here and uh, you really wanted to mix modern art with with pictures uh, uh from people that actually live there and uh, last summer when after we opened we had a lot of more guests than we expect expected uh and a lot of people came older people came and said i used to live here when, when i was a kid and then we asked them to to look into their photo albums and we, we got snapshots and uh, so they're kind of embedded all over. Um, and there you have our little logo. This this uh, we have a special nice craft bear producer in Gothenburg that made uh, a craft bear that's really, really goes well to shellfish that we serve a lot to our guests. And here you see the full image of the beautiful picture. Um, and um, this is some of the produce that we catch just around. We got fresh mackerel there and uh, lobster when it's lobster season. We, uh, the, 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 actually, the best spot for lobster was, uh, we realized that was only 50 meters, uh, which is very short, uh, outside the, the living room window. So you can, the guests can actually see if you catch something or not from land. Uh, and crabs and other crustaceans. Uh, crabs we can catch all year round. And that's me with a, with a, with a mackerel mask on. <laughs> and uh, it's a very social product. We, uh, we have a rule that our staff is eating with our guests, for example. So we don't want to be, want, we call it a home on the horizon. We also have some. Um, Hot, hot tubs that we pump salt water up. We, we have a desalination plant on the island. 
Uh, so we are actually drinking the seawater. So we are serving the, the water more pr proudly than the wine. We have really good wine though, but um, yeah, it's a little bit of the branding and um, here you can kind of see how, how far out it is. Uh, and we have a few other buildings. Uh, the one to the left is the gunpowder house where uh, we have the little kind of uh, chambre separée for dinners and stuff. You can also see the the cavitation there in the that was the way through their vegetables. Um, and the gunpowder house housed the gunpowder uh, when they had cannons before the um, fog horns were invented. And then the building just left to the to the lighthouse is the with the little tower on is the foghorn building. And then the one the white one in the front in front of that is the the food cellar. That's that's our wine cellar today. And then we have uh, uh, a little museum and uh, a, the, the bigger house uh, behind the, the main building is the um, where we have bigger dinner parties with up to 50 people. So this is our guest room, kind of simple, but very luxurious beds. And uh, there was an adventure to get them to the island. We don't have a very good port and we, we bring our <laughs> guests with either helicopter or rib boats. Um, sometimes we have to cancel nice bookings because of storms coming. I think I would, would like to talk to you guys about uh, um, if you have any experience with storm watching, because that's what we want to kind of try to dive into. And this is our most popular room. It's not used uh, very many days, but when it's um, still like this, it's a fantastic experience. We have a newlywed couple that uh, rented this and uh, they have a picture of a seagull waking them up, landing on his feet in the morning. Uh, here you can see the little bed. It, uh, it, it's also uh, in a nature reserve, Paternoster. Uh, it's called, this reefs are called Paternoster because uh, it means it's Latin for the Lord's Prayer. And um, it's it gotten its name because the sailors, when they approach this dangerous reef, they, they you know, prayed the Lord's Prayer to. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Uh, it's all fascinating, but. Uh... Uh, this, gives place, you... this, this place is definitely on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What an amazing place. And to sleep outside there on the on the bed on the rocks, what an experience that would be, as long as it doesn't rain. <laughs> but absolutely incredible. So um, I recommend uh, people, if you have a chance, it's a, it's a wonderful I thing. It's the longest event we've done. It was two hours and 14 minutes, but everybody was interesting. And uh, if you want to, uh, if you think you might want to stay at one of these places and or if you want to just got a like the vicarious experience of uh, seeing what they're like, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It covers lighthouse uh, vacation opportunities all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, this video is made possible. You know what I mean, the video automatically plays there. It's a little annoying, but um, so I want to go to, um, let's see here. Uh, oh, it's actually another one of the special virtual events. Under the heading of special virtual events, we've done several tours that are several vir virtual tours of individual lighthouses. We did Point Arena, Cal Northern California. We did Bolivar Point in Texas. Uh, more recently, we did Hillsborough Inlet Lighthouse in Florida with our uh, friend uh, Ralph Krugler, who's the historian for that lighthouse. Uh, so I was going to play you a very brief clip of the Bolivar Point event, which was April 4th of this year. Uh, and what's neat about it, and we've actually been able to do something more like this in, in each of these uh, these events of this type is to actually have the, a person go around uh, with their cell phone and show some of the place during the event live, which is kind of fun. So I'm gonna go to, let's see, 3125, right around here. And um, the, uh, the uh, 
Amy Maxwell Chase and her cousin Mark Boyt, Boyt uh, they're part of the, the two families that own this light station, and they have started an organization to restore the lighthouse tower itself, this tall cast iron tower. So I'm going to play you a little bit of it where uh, Amy was out on the, the grounds uh, with, with her cell phone. I'm going to give you all a glimpse into the front door. Here. Still see me? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Lips to the masonry and the spiral staircase. And again, this lighthouse is 117 feet tall. All right. Mark, you want to add anything? No, Amy, it looks good. If if I start talking, it may uh, I may my screen may take over, but it looks pretty good. Awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna stop there, but uh, it gives you the idea. And uh, that was a really fun event. They're doing some great work there. Uh, and uh, some of these events, uh, this one and the all three of the ones we've done with individual lighthouses also have had sort of VR tours that let you kind of walk through the lighthouse virtually. And we've shown some of that as well, which is a, a lot of fun. And I think these types of videos are great opportunities for people who they may, they may never get to Texas or beyond. And this way you can actually take an, a tour of the lighthouse without actually physically having to be there. Right. Uh, let's see here. I was going to play a little bit we, to, for the last two years, and we're planning to do it again this year in late November. We've done uh, what we call virtual galas for uh, Flying Santa. For I'm sure a lot of you know, the Flying Santa is a tradition, a New England lighthouse tradition that goes back to 1929, where a, a pilot uh, in Maine, uh, Bill Winkapaw, started flying his seaplane over the lighthouses, the isolated lighthouse and lighthouses, and he would drop presents out of the plane for lighthouse keepers and their families to show appreciation uh, for what they were doing and to draw attention to them. And Edward Rowe Snow, the very popular New England historian, picked it up and did it for more than 40 years. And there's still an organization, nonprofit Friends of Flying Santa, that does it by helicopter and lands at Coast Guard stations. Presents are given to the kids of Coast Guard families as a way of showing appreciation for, for these Coast Guard families. And I'm going to play you a little bit of just a very little bit of this uh, gala. It's actually a TV uh, news clip that we showed as part of it is from a TV station in Connecticut. Uh, so it's a couple of minutes long. I'm going to play that for you at one, let's see, one twelve twenty. So we had uh, Brian Tag, my friend, who's the president of Friends of Flying Santa. We had uh, Dolly Bicknell, the daughter of Edward Rose Snow, as part of the event, among uh, other special guests. So let me get to this news clip here. Remember into the role, you know, they're familiar with a lot of the units, a lot of the crews, and it just adds a little bit more of a personal touch. Wait a minute. So Tom got. I think I might have picked the wrong one. There are two, <laughs> two Flying Santa virtual galas. Yeah, I should have picked this one. Sorry, wrong one. Let me. One twelve twenty. There it is. Okay. And here we go. Screen sharing within screen sharing. The sound is glittering as little children wait patiently, <laughs> breathlessly anticipating the arrival of a Yuletide legend. And then, in a flash, he appears out of the clouds and zooms past Stratford Point Lighthouse. It was unbelievable. My son was so excited to see the chopper come in with Santa Claus. Forget Dasher and Dancer, good old Saint Nick is flying in style aboard a very small and agile helicopter. It was pretty cool how they circled around and, you know, the kids just went nuts. They loved it. From his high-tech sleigh, he can see welcoming waves and big smiles. So he descends as the breeze blows like crazy, creating flurries of gleeful excitement. Windy, windy, it looks like a tornado. After a year of being nice, not naughty, 
the kids see flying Santa step out of the chopper, ready to make their Christmas dreams come true. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. This all dates back to 1929, when a float plane pilot named William Winkapaw started literally dropping sacks of presents from the sky onto the grounds of coastal beacons so that the families of lighthouse keepers could have gifts and supplies for the holidays. So he figured it was a pretty lonely existence out there at Christmas, and he wanted to go out and uh, give them packages of coffee, candy, magazines, books, and uh, flew over on Christmas Day. When lighthouses became automated, the tradition changed, but remained just as special. Now, 82 years later, Flying Santa honors the families of Coast Guard personnel, our current heroes of the waters. They're out there doing their job every day, and this is our way of saying thanks for what they do. This modern day Flying Santa visits 33 lighthouses and Coast Guard stations in three days, delivering presents to more than 700 children from Maine to New York. Just a great appreciation that they recognize us and everything and all the kids and, you know, all of us out here to coming together as, you know, one big family. And the children's faces clearly show the magic of the season. Ah, oh, he is so excited. Like, now he believes in Santa Claus. <laughs> Something he'll never forget. Feeling like it's cool and awesome. For goodness sake, don't feel bad for Rudolph and Prancer. No, the reindeer rest up for Christmas. So <laughs> we, we don't want to wear them out. Santa is full of energy as his whirly bird slowly lifts off, bound for many more merry moments. A beautiful nautical tradition, full of volunteerism, gratitude, and good cheer, the perfect sentiments for Christmas time. You know, there's nothing commercial about it. I mean, we're here doing our job as, as a, a gesture of appreciation for what the Coast Guard does, and, and uh, we're happy to do it. That's Mommy Minute. Merry Christmas! <laughs> Sarah Cody, Fox, Connecticut. I'd say it's pretty cool and awesome. I agree with that kid. I don't know if you noticed that, but I could have sworn I saw a reindeer flying that helicopter. Okay. I <laughs> believe you. If you say so, it must be true. Okay. So I was going to show a little bit of one more of these uh, special virtual events. And this is kind of a change of pace from the one I just showed. Uh, this is a Haunted Lighthouses presentation I did. And the hell actually it was on Halloween uh, in 2020. October 31st, 2020, so almost two years ago. And I'm just going to show you a real brief clip from this 5625. I founded Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse as a chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation in 2001 to take care of this lighthouse. And soon after I started the group, I started hearing stories from the Coast Guard. Again, it's on an active Coast Guard station. Coast Guard is on watch 24 hours. And I started hearing these stories about uh, how they would see a woman uh, walking on the seawall at night and they would check and nobody was there. Uh, they um, saw uh, supposedly reports of a, a uh, man in an old uniform standing in front of the, the gate to the fort on the station. Another story that I commonly heard was that the, the person on watch in the lookout tower at the station would hear footsteps coming up the metal stairs in the watchtower and they would check and nobody was there. And that supposedly always happened around two or 3 a.m. Uh, so these stories were mounting, you know, I heard a bunch of them. And in August, 2005, we called in New England Ghost Project and it was the first ever paranormal investigation done there. And you see Ron Kolick on the right there and Maureen Wood, you saw them before at New London Ledge Light and Karen Mossy behind Maureen there. That's in the watch room of the lighthouse. So uh, Karen did some recordings, again, uh, trying to capture EVPs, electronic voice phenomena. And after midnight, she was in the lighthouse by herself at the top of the stairs, right where she is in this picture. And she said into the recording, who's there? And she seems to get an answer and I'll play it for you. It's not real distinct. It's definitely not a class A EVP, but let me play it again. Karen believed that the voice is saying captain. To me, it, it sounds like it might be the captain real quick. Let me play it, play it again. 
So again, not super clear, but that's why I told you the story about Joshua Cardley uh, liking to be called Captain. Is this him? Obviously, we don't, we can't say for sure, but it's, I, I find it uh, kind of interesting and fun to think that it might be him. Uh, this was a recording from another night. Well, I could let this play, but I'm not going to. I'll stop there. Uh, and uh, just in case anybody's interested, I do the Haunted Lighthouse talk pretty often, usually in the Halloween ta uh, season. And I've got a couple scheduled uh, here in New England, either virtually or in person. My website is newenglandlighthouses.net. Now you can find my lecture schedule on there if anybody's interested. Um, next, uh, we want to go back to the podcast playlist. I just want to say a little bit more about that. Let's see here. Okay. This video is made back to the playlist screen and you see it says lighthearted podcast, 135 videos. So I'll click on that. And it actually automatically starts playing the very first one, episode one from well over three years ago now, uh, which was an interview with the children's book author and illustrator, Sophie Blackall. Her book, Hello Lighthouse, won the Caldecott Award for uh, best children's book of the year. Uh, three years ago. Uh, Jeff, is that your uh, mic I'm, I'm hearing? Or I just want to make sure everybody has their mics muted and, until we open up for discussion in a few minutes. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to just play you a real, real brief clip from the Sophie Blackall interview here. Uh, let's see, 22, 2230. Some you read about had 11 children born in right. a lighthouse, right. and the the one, in fact, on on Quirpon Island had had uh, nine children. Mm -hmm. And at at its base, there's a tiny white picket fence uh, surrounded grave. I mean, it's it's as big as a shoebox, and that's where two of the infants who perished in childbirth were buried at the at the base of this lighthouse, and um, and that struck a chord immediately and, and just reminded me as I began to read about about so many different lighthouses that uh, that that all of them were filled with stories and stories of, of life and stories of loss and of and of death um, and that these stories were all recorded in the logbook uh, not as stories as such but as as just you know succinct brief notations alongside reports of weather or passing ships or oil usage um, and you'd stumbled across you would stumble across a you know something sort of profoundly human and and heartbreaking in its kind of brevity I'll stop there but she was a really interesting uh, interview and her book hello lighthouse is it one of the best lighthouse children's books ever for sure uh. Jeff, you're still that's still out there, right? Yep, I muted myself. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you. I just want to make sure I'm not uh, by myself here. Um, okay, I was going to play just one more podcast clip, and it's actually one of the most recent ones I posted. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm trying to make an effort to do some of the podcast episodes, not just as audio, like radio shows, but to do some as video episodes, so, because... I know some people uh, prefer to watch things rather than just listen to things. I'm kind of like that myself. So uh, the first all video episode I did was uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, another children's book author, Anna Crowley Redding, who wrote a really excellent new children's book called um, Courage Like Kate about Kate Moore, a longtime uh, keeper in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, so I'm going to play you a brief clip from this. And again, this is a video version of the podcast person. Um, and I, I know that your, your book uh, pretty much concentrates on her as a young girl learning to be a lighthouse keeper and kind mm -hmm. of skips ahead, uh, you know, to when she gets the actual appointment towards the end. But um, why did you decide to, to approach it that way to, to make it about her as a, as a young girl? because of the audience it's for young readers and so i want them to connect to her in such a visceral way and so really and this was interesting because in writing this story 
it's so fascinating that she was a lighthouse keeper. It's so fascinating that she's living out on this island. Like there were so many things that are fascinating about her. And so it, it took a long time for me to arrive at the heart of this story. And the heart of this story really is that at a time when women were expected to be seen sometimes and almost never heard, Mm -hmm. that she was doing something so heroic in spite of that while wearing pants, by the way. And that's the part that I want the young readers to take from this is, yes, there were these limitations and there were these expectations of who she would be because she was a girl. But she did what she wanted to do, what she had to do, what she was compelled to do anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's really the message that, I want them to take from from her life is having that kind of courage um, back to what we were saying about Tom Ellis. You know, when you feel that nervous, I'm going to stop, stop there, but I, she had a lot of really good things to say. Uh, and uh, again, it's another, I think a classic uh, children's lighthouse book just came out of uh, last month. Um, so uh, let's see here. I w want to mention that another category that we've done a, a bunch of, bunch of uh, events uh, are these lighthouse tour uh, retrospectives. As most of you know, the U.S. Lighthouse Society, uh, one of the signature things the society does is these lighthouse tours uh, domestically and internationally every year. There's uh, several uh, uh, in the U.S. and several overseas. And we've done, fifth, I think it's 15 now of these tour retrospectives where we've, uh, it's just what it sounds like. We've had the tour leaders as part of it, uh, kind of talking through what, what happened on these tours. And it's not just talking about the lighthouses, but it's the whole experience, uh, the cultural experience of going to these, these places and uh, the, the, uh, the experience of doing it with a group of friends. A lot of, we have a lot of repeat customers have done a lot of these tours. So I was gonna play a little bit of a tour retrospective of the Scotland, England tour that, uh, Jeff and I were both on with uh, with uh, Skip Sherwood. Skip and Mary Lee Sherwood were the tour leaders in 2017. And I'm just going to play like a, a minute or so clip from it. Here it is right here. And 128.20. All right, just to finish up here, some candid shots for friend Ron Bandock inside that lens, I believe, at Souter. Uh, here's uh, Ken and Diane in that same lens. And there's, you know, and again, here's Bill Wainscott. He, he just wandered off onto this golf course while we were waiting for something here and asked the guy if he could practice his putting. Uh, this is uh, Glenn and, and Trinity, his granddaughter, who was on the tour. And what a great addition, you know, a lot of us are old geezers and having her along just made it, you know, a wonderful trip. Uh, she's a wonderful young lady. Uh, Peggy Wayne's got driving a boat a long way somewhere. Phil and Mary and, and Ron, and there was this cat at Withern Sea here that everybody, you know, managed to befriend. There was me talking to my people. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this is, you know, trying to gather these people together is, is a very difficult task. My favorite sign on the whole tour was this sign that said, wanted good woman, must be able to clean, cook, sew, dig worms and clean fish, must have boat and motor. Please send picture of boat and motor. This was actually uh, where the light ship tying was that we found this sign. Uh, here's Mary Lee with her beer mustache, AJ, Captain, there's Bosley and his friend, the Corgi. Uh, we're not sure what uh, is going on here. Uh, Jeff will have to explain that one. Um, here I had a chance to shake hands with, with Shakespeare. Not sure what Nancy's drinking here, but I'm sure she enjoyed it. Uh, this is classic. If you know the Chisholm's, they take pictures of everything. And here we caught them taking pictures of their, uh, their coffee drinks in, in some restaurant. And there's Trinity saying, that's all, folks. That's it. Now, uh, I'll stop there. But that was a, a fun tour and it was a fun event looking looking back on it. I uh, love that. Send photo of boat. <laughs> <laughs> boat, motor and boat. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so 
we're getting near the end here, but so they've got all these tour retrospectives that are a lot of fun to look at. And we will do more of those. Um, and we've also done, well, I've done a couple of videos of the tours I've been on, including a main tour of last year. Um, so there's the category, the playlist category of USLHS tours. And some of them are little segments from years and years ago. Some of them have been up for quite a while, but I did uh, the main tour last year. I'll just play a very little bit of the beginning of this. goes on for 12 minutes and uh, highlights of the, the tour. So there's, there's video clips mixed in as well as stills, but more recently I was on the Ireland tour for 23 days in July, which was absolutely fantastic, uh, led by Jerry and Margie Rowland. And I did a, a 40, it, it took a lot a longer video to do the highlights of that. It's 45 minutes long, but uh, I won't, I won't play it, but just. We ran into it. was part of a helicopter ride over the Aran Islands. Uh, and for a second there, you saw part of a tractor parade that we accidentally ran into in one town, which was pretty interesting. So uh, again, I, I don't wanna get too carried away here. We've already been here for about an hour. So I wanna uh, wind things down here, but I wanna mention also that our uh, Ralph Krugler, who's done doing a lot of great work for the society has posted some videos lately including uh one uh, i'm getting i it's hard for me to to think and talk at the same time i think um oh we've also got this wayne wheeler category i want to mention that but i just mentioned ralph krugler has done some videos lately and one he just posted a couple of days ago was about tours that are going on this weekend at uh green's ledge lighthouse in uh in connecticut and here it is let me just play a little bit of it this then it's passed grandeur i don't think the lighthouse ever looked as good as it as it does today even even when it was first built back in 1902 so they're going to see a a very stable uh uh structure which was our first goal uh you know this light could have come down uh not unlike uh orchard um the orchard light off of uh, staten island during uh the Sandy event 10 years ago, this light. So I'll stop it there, but it's a really good interview with Tim Petty, who's the president of the Greens Ledge uh, Light Preservation Society. And again, they are doing their first ever public tours as we speak this weekend. And uh, they've done just an amazing job there. But Ralph's gonna be doing more of these uh, types of interviews that you'd be seeing on the channel as well. And he also did one on the turtle, uh, turtle uh, turtles who lay eggs uh, at the Beach by uh, Hillsborough Inlet Lighthouse. And this was a neat little video. Under cover of darkness of night, they swim ashore. To dig a nest in the sand. Preservationists about 100 hatchlings make their way to sea. Mostly, they hatch at night. So that's a fairly short video. I recommend that you check that out. And again, Ralph is gonna be do, producing more uh, content moving forward. So, um,
at this point, I think we're ready to come out of uh, screen sharing here. Jeff, I don't know if you, oh, I wanna get back to the front of the channel again, just mention the subscribe button again. And Jeff, would you like to say something about that again? Well, I just think uh, there's well, the one more video I wanted to share was the, oh. uh, the Wayne Wheeler. Right, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and found it. Whoops. Uh, let's see, which, which video do we wanna show of Wayne? Would it be this one? It was the uh, one we did the book signing. Yeah, and so people who don't know, Wayne Wheeler is our was our founder and he's our, currently our president emeritus. And uh, he basically uh, started the Lighthouse Preservation Movement uh, back in the early, set, late 70s. And uh, still to this day does speaking engagements and what have you. In fact, uh, next week he's gonna be honored with a, uh, uh, a meritorious public service award in Washington DC by the Coast Guard. Uh, he's done a, he's, an, he's had an amazing career uh, with Lighthouse Preservation. And I thought uh, this, uh, this short video that he made, uh, that we made for him at a book signing, it's such a great uh, uh, what short I piece and it, uh, it kind of exemplifies oh. his knowledge of the uh, Lighthouse Society and Lighthouse Preservation. Right. I just realized this is the wrong one. This is the yeah, video you're the talking right about at Stonington, yeah. Connecticut, at the Stonington Correct. Lighthouse in Connecticut. So yeah. this is about uh, five or so minutes long. So yeah. do we just want to show this whole thing, Jeff? Is that right? I would, yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. Sure. Okay, let's do that. And then we'll come out of screen sharing. If anybody has any questions or have a little bit more discussion as we uh, wind down for today. So let me play this for you. today. I asked them what they wanted me to talk about. I give a course that's 16 hours and I figured that was a little long standing up especially so I'll I'll make it short but I, I want to ramble a little bit. First of all my my great 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 uh, 1637 came here to Stonington from Lynn Mass the year before he landed from England and the wheelers were here for 300 years so I've got a lot of a history here. The Stonington Lighthouse uh, short-lived but a charmer and people ask me sometimes uh, what's your favorite lighthouse and I'll say well they're like grandchildren some are more charming than others <laughs> but I have been here before and uh, many of you probably knew Louise Pittaway uh, just a charming lovely wonderful woman and I always enjoyed stopping in and chatting with her uh, when we have one of our tours through here it's a unique lighthouse. There's no other lighthouse like this in the United States or anywhere in the world that I know of. I mean, a lot of times they'll use the same plan for a lighthouse and you'll see some like uh, the one over at Noank. There's several of that design in the Northeast and, and others like that. Uh, they asked me to talk just a little bit about the Lighthouse Society and I'd like to. I, I started that in my dining room in 1984. I just thought it would be kind of a cute idea to get a few people together. And uh, it pretty soon the dining room was an office and pretty soon we had three or 4,000 members. So I had to quit my job to do it full time. Uh, and it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, we put out a quarterly 48 page quarterly magazine, a very slick magazine. And we have a bulletin that talks about um, some of our people around the country that have done good things with lighthouses. We donate some money to lighthouse uh, restoration. Uh, we have tours all over the world from Russia to South Africa to from Turkey to New Zealand and Australia. And uh, they raise money for the society and money that we can occasionally give out to, to other lighthouse groups. We restored a Coast Guard light ship. Um, we got that about one year into the society 
donated to us. It was a rust bucket. We took it up to, we were in San Francisco, took it up to Oakland. I called the port and I said, I can't find a place to tie this 600 ton, 130 foot light ship up. And the port of Oakland very graciously said, well, we have an industrial pier you can use. How long do you think it'll take? And I said, oh, probably six months, 19 years. <laughs> we were there 19 years with free rent, free electricity and free water. And we have two lighthouses in Chesapeake Bay. We're restoring Thomas Point Shoal and Hooper Strait. And um, we have a library about two to 3,000 books. And this book is, uh, is a work of art. And it's just so seldom you see authors really get into the real nitty gritty, to go to the archives, to find uh, all of the facts instead of the rumors. Uh, that, uh, that are uh, tended to a particular lighthouse, the construction, the history, whatever. So this is a really, uh, this is a keeper. In fact, you may want to buy two of them. Maybe you have a, a lighthouse nut in your, uh, <laughs> somewhere in your, uh, in your family that could use that as a Christmas present. It's a good idea right there. Anyways, it's, uh, I, uh, I just want to say that um, Jim called me first and asked if I could come up and I thought, well, I don't know, it's got a long way to go and so on. So. And then Betsy called and she sweet-talked me right into it. I mean, I couldn't put the phone down. Uh, I'm going to, now just a second, just a, we're going to do this, we're going to do the. Okay, I'll be there, I'll be there, I promise. So thank you for inviting me. It's, it's, I've met some nice people here, I've really enjoyed that. Um, and I hope when they get around to raising money that you people will take an active interest in and helping restore this lighthouse, which is a unique lighthouse, and it can be done. Thank you. out of screen sharing here all right always i'm always happy in these events to come back from uh screen sharing and see the people are still here because you know it's like we're talking to ourselves you can't see anybody while we're while we're talking so thank you all for hanging in there so uh jeff what do you think shall we uh open up for questions or comments from people sounds good to me okay and uh let me uh well first of all in the chat we have well, we have a couple of comments, um, but I don't see any questions there. But if you would, if you have any uh, comments or questions, uh, probably the best, easiest way to handle that would be, um, and uh, I don't see the same control, so it always gets confusing to me. But I think if you click on participants in the window that opens up, you it has an option to digitally raise your hand. It says raise hand. Are people seeing that? And if you have a, a question you want to ask verbally, you can do that and we'll we'll see that you've digitally raised your hand and we can call on you. Is that making sense to people? Yeah, and you know, if there's no questions, you know, as you guys are moving through, looking through the website or looking through YouTube, you know, we're always available to answer questions, you know, offline. So you can contact us by email or by phone. Yeah. You know, smoke signal, however you want to. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get you straightened away. Absolutely. And if anybody has any, uh, any comments or questions, uh, you can also use the chat uh, chat option. Just click on chat. You can type your question in there if you want to do that. But we're also we're not only interested in questions you might have, but ideas. You know, if you have an idea for a type of video we could do that we haven't been doing, or uh, how we could do them better, you know, we're always, as Jeff said, you know how to get in touch with us. We're always interested. You come across. Excuse me. You come across content that you think we should be sharing uh, mm -hmm. let us know for sure yeah and we we do that on social media as well we're always posting uh videos from other places on facebook and and uh and elsewhere so uh, we always want to know about those there's a lot of good lighthouse related stuff going on all over the place uh, we got a hand raised jeremy oh yeah excellent okay lily has you have to unmute yourself, Lily, and you can go ahead and ask go ahead and ask your question. 
Here you go. Hello, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and this is my first time here, so uh, I love it. <laughs> I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, and I would just like to know if you have any uh, video from Lighthouse in Puerto Rico. What a good question. Welcome, Lily. Thank <laughs> you so much for taking part. Thanks for your question. Thank you. That is a great question. And uh, no, the answer is no. I don't believe we have anything on YouTube to do with uh, Puerto Rico. And I'd also love to do something on the podcast related to it. Uh, so is do you have uh, any involvement yourself in or is it, uh, an interest or do you have any actual involvement in the lighthouses there? I'm wondering. Uh, well, no, I'm not, mm -hmm. but I love them as well and we have a lot of uh, lighthouse here that are um uh, sorry my english is not too good but <laughs> your, um your english is great there are, <laughs> there are some that um are not good in not good shape and i yep. i i was wondering as well if we have any uh, association if you know here in in the island so maybe we can be part of it most of the lighthouse in, in puerto rico are part of the government and right. some are, some of them are closed some mm -hmm. they as i say are very uh, in bad conditions yes especially after hurricane maria so tomorrow we are expecting another hurricane here Oof. uh fiona but um i think we're gonna lose our lighthouse if we keep uh, not taking care of it, you know. So, so yeah. really, we do, we do uh, talk to a number of people in Puerto Rico. Um, we actually have uh, an engineer who works with us who's down there actually right now assessing the status of the Puerto Rican lighthouses, at least some of them. And we mm -hmm. also are, uh, are we have this we have an annual uh, grant program, and uh, Puerto Rican lighthouses are welcome to apply for funding any any every year. So. Uh, you know, we put that message out, um, but unfortunately, to date, we haven't received any uh, uh, applications. One of the problems is, is that because the lighthouses are all governmentally controlled, uh, they're not out there uh, writing grants at the moment. They're, you know, Puerto Rico is dealing with a lot of other issues besides lighthouse preservation. So, um, but we're doing our best and we stay in contact with people uh, who run the lighthouses in Puerto Rico. Yeah. But I love the idea of uh, I'm going to pursue that, maybe do something in the podcast. I, uh, Jeff and I have talked about the idea of maybe at some point doing a Spanish language version of the podcast. I would love to make that happen. I'm not sure when it might happen. But um, part of the problem is uh, some of the some countries finding people who speak English as well as you. I know there's a lot of people in Puerto Rico who speak speak English. So maybe I can figure out a way to do a, a podcast uh, episode about that. Somebody uh, else. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, my last comment. Um, yep. I'm working in the tourism industry in Puerto Rico. Okay. So maybe whatever you need, or maybe I can start finding out what we can do, or what do you need to come to Puerto Rico and, and do your and do the videos and everything and this in our lighthouse here. So <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. Uh, so actually, we uh, when you register for an event like this, we have a list of email addresses. We don't we don't do anything with those, but I will. I can access your email sure. address and contact you, or you can yeah. contact us. But I'd like to pursue this, and I appreciate that very much. Of course, I'm I'm I don't know anything, but if you uh, let me know what where I can start. Mm -hmm. I will. <laughs> yeah, we can we can figure it out. I'm sure we can figure it out together. You know what? Uh, projects always begin with enthusiastic people like Lily. You know, it just takes one person <laughs> really to get the ball rolling. So we definitely will reach out to you. Thank you. That's right. Yes. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. You're welcome. The, the most important thing I think we can kind of I think we probably want to end this fairly soon because I don't see any more questions. But the most important thing we could uh, do at the end of this meeting before you guys uh, uh, go offline, go to our YouTube page and subscribe because that's going to help us out greatly and it doesn't cost you anything and it uh, will make all the difference in the world for the lighthouse society so mm -hmm. there is a question in the chat 
Uh, the question is also whether there'll be another virtual flying Santa event this year, and the answer is yes. Uh, I am actually on the board of Friends of Flying Santa, and we had a meeting just a few nights ago, and we decided that we're going to do that another virtual event on uh, Saturday, November 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern time, so it'll be later than like today's event. A lot of the events we've done at four o'clock Eastern time, but this will be seven o'clock Eastern time on Saturday, November 19th, another Flying Santa virtual gala, a co-presentation -pre of uh, Friends of Flying Santa and USLHS. Yeah, I really wish we could get a Flying Santa program out on the West Coast. That would be wonderful uh, mm -hmm. in other areas besides New England. But there also was another question. Uh, Marianne was asking if, uh, if the Lighthouse lodging list on our website is up to date. And yes, it is. Um, it may not be inclusive of everything. We try to keep it uh, constantly. Be, I mean, it's a constant effort to try to keep it comprehensive. But as far as we know, everything on there is up to date and current. Yeah, it is a lot of work to keep it up to date. I, I, I used to have a similar list on my website. I got rid of it because it was too much, <laughs> too much work. And, because, <laughs> and also you're, you're doing it. Uh, we're, we are doing it for the USLHS. Uh, so, but it, things are always changing. Lighthouses are being sold, some close, others open and so forth. So, yeah. Yeah. But we just, for those of you who don't, don't know this, if you go to our website and you go, there's a, there's a section just about lighthouse lodging and it's all, uh, it's all by state. So you can look at the different states in the, in the United States that have, uh, uh, lodging available at lighthouses and, um, it provides you all the contact information. That's what we're referring to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I stayed at the Bell Toot Lighthouse in England in early July. That was a pretty incredible experience. Uh, just thought I'd throw that in. So I don't know if there's any more questions or comments. Or Jeff, if you want to. No, that's it. Subscribe, 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 please. And tell all your friends to subscribe. We want to get to 1,000. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much. This was fun. I hope you all enjoyed it. And there will be more. There's going to be the Flying Santa event on November 19th. I think there'll be something uh, else in between now and then to be announced. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. So thank you all. Yep. Thanks everybody. It was nice seeing you. And this video will be video of this will be posted on YouTube and the USLHS website as well within a few days. Take care, everybody. Okay. Thanks Enjoy again. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye. Hope to see you soon. Definitely.